Whenever we take a measurement in a marketing research project, that measurement will qualify as one of four different levels of measurement quality. Those four levels are nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio level. Any data that you ever observe can be categorized into one of these four categories. You won't forget what these four categories are because you won't forget the French word for black, noir. The order of these four different measurement levels is important. Nominal level data is the lowest quality or least versatile for analysis, whereas ratio level data is the most versatile for analysis. Also, keep in mind that higher level data has the same properties and abilities as lower level data. It just gains additional things that can be done with it during analysis. In other words, for those of you familiar with Mario Kart, imagine Mario is driving around on the Mario Kart racetrack and that's nominal level data, the lowest level quality. If Mario happens to gain three red shells, all of his abilities that he could do without the red shells are still present. He's just now gained additional powers and additional abilities. That's higher level measurements. Let's provide some examples and go deeper into each one of these different levels of measurement quality. Nominal level data is data that can only be used to apply labels or grouping different things together. Commonly, nominal level data is also called categorical data. Let's take a look at a few examples. If I ask the question, what is your favorite color? You could only respond with a categorical answer. By the way, my favorite color is green. If I ask the question, what US zip code do you presently live in? Even though the answer would be a numerical score, in reality, it's a simple categorical grouping. You can't add two different zip codes together to solve for a different zip code, for example. Finally, if I presented a question in a particular format, the response itself could also be nominal level data. If I asked the question, if you had to pick one, what is your favorite brand? Notice that the way I ask this question forces people to merely pick a single option. There's no rating of how much they like it, no ranking of how much they like it. Instead, we simply identify the one thing that they consider their favorite of the available options. We consider nominal level data the lowest level of measurement data because, it, because when we analyze the data, it only allows us to engage in counting or percentage reporting of that information. For example, in 2015, YouGov reported some information from a variety of different countries to the simple question of what is your favorite color? Notice this stacked bar chart here is reporting the percentage of respondents who answered that their favorite color was among the following different options. By the way, we can clearly see here that the color blue was the most common favorite color amongst all of the countries. The most common occurrence of a value or label is called the mode. You might remember that from your introductory statistics course. When the measurement we take is ordinal level data, we are capable of organizing the data in sequences of more to less or higher to lower. This is different than nominal data where we couldn't rank or sort things into a meaningful order. On the other hand, ordinal data isn't quite as rich as some of the other examples of measurement data. However, ordinal level data still has a limitation. Even though we can rank the data, we don't know exactly how distant data is from one another, even though we can rank it. Look at this example. It looks a lot like the question we saw earlier, but it's a little different. It says to please rank these brands from most favorite to least favorite. Clearly, by someone sorting from most favorite to least favorite, we would have a nice ordered ranking. What we wouldn't have is we wouldn't know if the difference between someone's first and second favorite brand is entirely different than the distance between their second and third most favorite brand. This is very relevant for marketers. Maybe the difference between the first and second most favorite brands is razor thin. On the other hand, the difference between the second and third most favorite brand is drastically distant. That would imply a brand manager for the second most favorite brand may be able to become the most favorite brand for this particular consumer. Whereas the brand in third position, they might as well be in fourth, fifth, sixth, or lower. Another example where we would capture ordinal data is something like this. Identify the first and second most important features you consider when shopping for a new smartphone. With some options presented, we ask people to select their first and second most favorite. Presumably, this would allow us to know that it's their top and second most important feature. And then we would merely group all the other features into some third level ranking. Sometimes it might look like the kind of data that we're capturing is richer than ordinal data, but upon closer inspection of how we measure it, it merely allows us to rank things. Consider this question. 
in the last month, about how many times would you say you socially gathered in a group of 10 or more people? Now that question implies that we could write an exact number in, right? Zero, one, 30, 12, so on. But look at the options that were presented to the person taking the survey. Zero times, one time, two to three, four to six, or seven or more. Those last three options are important. Clearly, if someone selects this seven or more, we definitely know that this individual ranks higher on social gathering activity compared to the others, but because of the way these options were presented, we don't know by exactly how much. Individuals who check the four to six times option may have meant four, five, or six. We don't know exactly. And those individuals who selected seven or more may have meant seven, or they may have meant 23. Because of this ambiguity in the options, we are capturing merely ordinal data and not something more rich. The analysis of ordinal data allows us to report the mode in percentages, just like we did with nominal data, but it also allows us to report things in what we call percentiles. You may be familiar with the most common percentile, the median, where data is split in the upper 50% and the lower 50%. Or you may be familiar with percentile rankings in terms of standardized testing, where people may score in the 30th percentile, 60th percentile, 90th, and so on. Here's an example of some rank order data presented. At the time that this video was produced, these were the top 10 songs that were played the most on Spotify. Clearly, Shape of You by Ed Sheeran and Rockstar by Post Malone were the top two ranked songs for Spotify in terms of the number of plays. They're very close by virtue of them being first and second. However, we realize once we actually look at the raw number of streams, there's a drastic difference between the first and second position a difference of roughly 600 million plays. Notice how Rockstar and One Dance are much closer in terms of actual values, even though they share the similar rank difference uh, of two and three relative to one and two. Interval level data is the next highest quality level of data that we may measure. When we collect data on an interval scale, we are assuming that the distance between each one of the scale points is equally spaced. Consider this survey question again. Looks familiar to previous, but we've made some adjustments. Here it says select the option that best represents how you feel about each brand. Notice that for each of the four brands represented here, there is now a five point liking scale being used. If we assume that the data that we're collecting here is interval scaled, we are assuming that the distance, in this case sort of the psychological distance between strongly dislike and dislike is the exact same distance as between dislike and neither like nor dislike, neither like nor dislike and like, or like and strongly like. So these little equal distant gaps are taken quite literally, but they are still an assumption. Now one thing that interval data doesn't have is an absolute meaning for the value of zero. Instead, the placement of a zero, zero value, if it exists, is completely arbitrary. Let me show you what I mean. If survey questions like this existed on a real marketing research survey, it is most likely that the codebook values used for these answers would look like this, a one to five scale where strongly like is five and strongly dislike is one. However, the use of a one to five scoring mechanism is in fact arbitrary. We could also do something like this, where strongly dislike is negative two, strongly like is two, and neither like nor dislike is scored as zero. Notice how we just casually slid the placement of a zero value wherever we felt like placing it. Let's illustrate how it seems like this placement of the zero value seems like a big deal, but on further inspection, it's really not. When we analyze interval level data, we gain a lot of power in terms of what we can do. We can now calculate the average and then any summary statistics that correspond to based off the average, like variance, standard deviation, and a bunch of other common statistic values that you're used to seeing from your introductory statistics text. Of course, you can still do all the same things that you could do with nominal and ordinal data as well. Now let's imagine that we collected 100 survey responses to these four survey questions. If we used a one to five coding and then calculated the average for these four questions, we may see something like this where Adidas had a score of 4.3, and New Balance, in this example, performed the worst with an average score of 2.7. We would interpret this as, on average, respondents generally liked, nudging towards strongly liking Adidas, whereas for New Balance, respondents generally neither liked nor disliked, nudging towards dislike. Now what would happen if we used negative two to positive two coding when we conducted this analysis? First of all, standard deviation would not change whatsoever. I won't talk about that here, but you can consult your statistics text for why that's the case. But of course the mean would shift 
because now we're using a zero where neither like nor dislike is. When using this coding, Adidas would have an average score of 1.3, whereas New Balance would have an average score of negative 0.3. How do we interpret that? The interpretation, it turns out, is exactly the same. When interpreting Adidas, we would say, on average, people tended to like Adidas, nudging towards strongly like. And on average, people neither like nor dislike New Balance, nudging towards dislike. Notice how the placement of the zero did not impact the way that we actually interpreted the results that we reported. That's what I mean by interval level data, data having an arbitrary placement of a zero value. This leads us to another important observation. Whenever we are measuring subjective properties in marketing research projects, we should keep in mind that interval level data is the absolute highest quality of data that we can possibly acquire for subjective properties. It's impossible to gather ratio level data for subjective properties. Ratio level data is only possible when we collect objective properties. Ratio level data is exactly the same as interval level data, except it has one important distinction. The value of zero has a real, absolute meaning. Only objective properties can achieve ratio level data. That is to say, not all objective properties are able to achieve it though. Look at the following examples. Please answer the following question. How many pairs of shoes do you presently own? Notice here that if someone currently has no pairs of shoes, meaning zero, that would be a meaningful, non-arbitrary value. As best as you can recall, in the last 12 months, how many pairs of shoes have you bought and how many pairs of sandals have you bought? And again, value of zero would mean something important here. Someone has, in fact, not bought shoes or sandals. Sometimes we may take ratio level measurements even, and they would still account as ratio level, even though they may be imprecise. Look at this example. Rounding up to the nearest hundred dollars, notice that rounding effect there creates imprecision, how much money have you spent on footwear in the last 12 months? This would still constitute ratio level data, although we would recognize that just if someone wrote 300 in here, we would know that that number is likely to be somewhat imprecise. In the last month, how many times have you visited Zappos? Again, zero would be something meaningful. Look at this last question. In the last year, have you returned more than two pairs of shoes or sandals? Now this question is still trying to measure an objective property, just like the previous questions, but look at the response category, yes and no. While the question itself is trying to measure something objective, the response category of yes or no means that this particular question will not capture ratio level data because we won't know the exact number of shoes or sandals that this person returned. In terms of analyzing ratio level data, we can still do, of course, all of the same analysis that we might consider with interval, ordinal, or nominal level data. In addition, there are some additional types of analysis that are possible. First, there are actually alternative ways to calculate an average. There really isn't just one way to calculate an average. The ratio level data is, uh, allows us to calculate some alternative options. Perhaps more relevant for marketing research, ratio level data allows us to calculate meaningful ratios, hence the name, or fractions. Let me show by way of a simple example. Imagine a survey respondent who said that they bought two pairs of shoes in the last 12 months and four pairs of sandals in the past 12 months. We can clearly say that this person bought twice as many sandals as they bought shoes. In other words, we took a fraction, four divided by two. The reason we can take this fraction and interpret it meaningfully is because there's a real non-arbitrary zero. Well, consider the following example. When I go to the movies, I tend to prefer superhero movies over other genres. And here we see a standard Likert scale five point. Now, if it's an interval level scale, we treat each one of these points as equally distant from one another. And clearly here, when we see this on this, on this slide, they are equally distant from one another. But these equal distances in the, on paper are not necessarily how they map onto someone's mind. Here we have the, coding, the scoring codes that we may use. Notice I used a zero for neither agree nor disagree, but that's an arbitrary point. I could use any other value. I could slide it from one, two, three, four, and five from strongly disagree to strongly agree being five because the zero is an arbitrary place. Let's imagine a person who is extremely agreeable. When they face this question, when they go to the movies, I tend to prefer superhero movies over other genres. Perhaps they have a bit of an acquiescence bias. They have a tendency to want to strongly agree with people. 
or they're just the kind of person who falls in line. In that person's mind, there's not equal spacing between these concepts. Instead, this person is very likely and very easy to strongly agree with this type of statement. Notice how the strongly agree button uh, option here has shrank towards the neutral point, whereas strongly disagree and disagree have moved further out to the left. Now imagine an alternative kind of person, a person who's very hard to be willing to agree nor disagree. They're very wishy-washy, so they tend to always be neutral on things. When this person sees this question, they may be heavily inclined to always neither agree nor disagree, and they, for them to agree, they must stretch and they must be very intensely uh, in agreement with this particular statement. In other words, for each one of these individuals, it's the mental distance between each one of these labels that generates, uh, that generates how they feel about these particular concepts. But if these scales really are interval, they must be equally spaced. But it's readily clear here that these aren't necessarily equally spaced for each person. Instead, they're only ordinally spaced. We do know that strongly agreeing is certainly greater than agreeing for every person, but we don't know by how much. That's why earlier I said for these types of subjective scales, we as marketing researchers assume that we're dealing with interval data, but we're actually only certain that we're dealing with ordinal level data. Why do we do this? Well, interval data is extremely easy to work with. Once you can calculate an average, and once you can calculate a variance in standard deviation, there's a number of statistical tools that we can use that we don't have available to us when we're dealing with ordinal level data. This is a convenience for us that makes life a bit easier. In addition, there's some research out there that suggests that when we take these subjective continuum scales and treat them as interval, even though they may only be ordinal, we're not as punished as heavily as it may seem when we're conducting our analysis. Instead, it usually just means that we need to collect a slightly larger sample size than normal sample size calculations would imply. Okay, now that we've introduced the four different levels of measurement, why should we even care about this? This feels awfully like the kind of academic thing that shows up on a test, but not necessarily the kind of thing that actually matters in the real world for a marketer. Fortunately, that's not true at all. In fact, measurement level is enormously important. When you, if you have the ability to look at a particular piece of data and identify what measurement level it's at, you have an upper hand compared to other individuals dealing with data. First, by knowing the level of data you're dealing with, it tends to reveal the types of statistical procedures that are proper for analysis. In addition, by understanding the level of data you're dealing with, it helps you understand the ways that you can visualize and present that data to others so that they can easily understand it. In addition, by understanding the level of data that you're dealing with, it in indirectly or partially gives you information about the difficulty a respondent taking your survey will have in answering a particular question, and it'll also give you some insights into the questionnaire wording approach when you're actually writing the individual questionnaire items that is best suited for designing that question. Take a look at this chart here. This is a standard pie chart. This is a pie chart that's appropriate to use because we know we're dealing with nominal level data. Order doesn't actually matter just the amount of individuals responded a particular way. For consumer loyalty rankings, we know we can't report the average ranking, but we can report the percentiles of individuals who responded in a particular way to each question. For the interval question, we can also report those scales, but we can report the mode, median, and, as we see in the bottom right-hand corner there, the average value. Similarly, for ratio level data, we can report the mode, median, averages, and we can report all those respondents that we had that were 0%. An important thing to keep in mind when thinking about measurement level is if you collect data that's rich in quality, like ratio or interval, you can always rescale it down if it suits your purposes later. But if you collect low level data, such as nominal or ordinal data, you can't scale it back up after the fact. Let's take a look at this net promoter scale question again. We already learned how we handle the coding here. After people respond from zero to 10, we then recode people into detractors, passive, or promoters. Or put another way, we collect interval level data, people scoring 0 to 10. So we have five people here, 0, 6, 10, 8, and 9 were their responses. But for purposes of the net promoter score scale, we don't actually use this interval level data. Instead, we recode it into nominal level data, detractors, promoters, and passives, just buckets of individuals. And then we use our calculations. Conversely, we, we couldn't go the other way. If we started by categorizing somebody as a detractor, after the fact, if someone asked, well, which detractors are the biggest detractors and which, which detractors are only mild detractors, we couldn't answer that question. Something that emerges once we realize some of these facts about measurement level is why shouldn't we just always capture high quality data, interval or ratio level data? The answer is, well, we should. If we can collect interval or ratio level data with no downside, we should in fact do so. However, there's often a data richness versus survey respondent frustration trade-off. Consider these three different questions. 
exactly how much money did you spend last month on apps, either purchases within an app or for the app itself. Next question, how much money did you spend on apps in the last month? And then we offer the option $0, $1 to $5, or more than $5. Finally, did you spend any money on apps in the last month, either on purchases within an app or for the app itself? And we just give them the option yes or no. If you were given these survey questions, which one would be the hardest one for you to respond to? Most people would probably pick the first option. It'd be hard to recall exactly how much money you spent. This would mean that people have to spend a lot of their co cognitive load on trying to properly answer this particular question on the survey, tiring them out and getting them frustrated. However, if they answer this question, we would actually have ratio level data. We would know the exact dollar amount. Probably the easiest of these three questions to answer is the one at the bottom. Did you spend any money at all? They merely have to recall if some sort of expenditure occurred. This would be nominal level data though. We'd be stuck with a lower level quality of data and we wouldn't have the deep insight into which types of people spent particularly large amounts of money. This is what we mean by the idea of sometimes when we collect data in marketing research, there's a trade-off between catch high measurement level data versus not frustrating our respondents.